Good morning, Grace Baptist Church. We are in the middle of June, if you can believe it. It's so good to have you all with us today. I'm excited to be joined today by Eric and Barb Lanier. They'll be singing with me and we will be lifting our hearts and our minds to the heavens as we praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Eric. Particularly in these troubled times, we're called to remember. When Jesus was asked, what was the greatest commandment? This was his answer. The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandments greater than these. Jesus calls each of us to remember what he did for us. He invites us into his holy presence. Let's sing together, O oh, come to the altar. There's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. 
praise you, Lord. As believers, we desire to know God's word, and more importantly, to know him through his word. Let's sing this prayer together from our hearts. There are two scripture readings for today. The first one comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. 
Now this is the commandment, the statues and the rules, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son, and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The second scripture reading for today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Good morning. It's good to be back with you after a couple of weeks away. Uh, hopefully you all had a chance to listen to Darnell's message last week. Um, it was great to see him in person. I got to see him in person. We got to chat here outside for a couple hours afterwards and just catch up. And so hopefully you heard his message and uh, hopefully there were things that God spoke to you from uh, as it did to me. So um, this morning we're going to be going uh, forward again. I just want to give a couple announcements. Um, tonight, uh, June 14th at I think 6 p.m., look for your email. So there's an all-church meeting. Uh, there should be instructions on how to join. It's going to be on Zoom, and so we'll make sure that you are aware for that. Also, at the end of this sermon, we're going to have communion. So before you get too comfortable in your seats or your couches or covering up with blankets, whatever you got going, uh, make sure you can have those ready for the end of the sermon so you're not caught by surprise. And so with that, uh, I will uh, give the kids jokes for those kids that are sitting around listening, waiting for this one moment before they run off to not hear me the rest of the day. Uh, where? was Solomon's temple located? The answer? On the side of his head. There you go. Uh, thank you, Ed Nichols, for that one. All right, so these next two weeks, uh, where are we going to be going? Um, and so doing two, two in a row these next couple weeks, uh, I, I want to go into some concepts, some themes that I've spoken about that have wildly impacted my life, um, that I've spoken about but not gone deep into. And so those two things are one, which is today, is going to be the Jesus Shema. And so I'm stealing that um, from some commentators and Bible Project. Is what is the Shema and how did Jesus adapt that for us that we latch on to? It becomes meaningful to us. And then the other one's going to be covenant kingdom. Uh, and that's going to be the ideas of who am I? Why am I here? How does God want to relate with me? And what does God want me to do? And to me, those are big questions that we, that we all ask. And it's big questions I think these younger generations are asking and so how does Covenant Kingdom help us answer that? So these two have been wildly formative for me in my faith and, and wildly helpful as I look at how to live out my faith. And so why the Shema? Um, I think oftentimes I grew up in a faith that often defended itself 
and often got in theological arguments or Christians who would argue with each other over what it meant to believe or how to understand or believe these certain things. The only creed that I had to live by was the Apostles' Creed that we quote in churches. I didn't know what it meant to, to have something that I could kind of have like a declaration of what I believe and what it means to live this thing out. And and even what the Jewish people do, even t- today, they have these things, that boxes they put on their foreheads and their wrists, and going with Deuteronomy 6, and the idea of binding them on your foreheads and your wrists, and they're called Teflim, and they put the Shema in there. It's one of the commands they write on a little piece of paper and put in those boxes. And so but I always grew up not knowing what it meant. I thought it was a Jewish thing. I didn't, didn't know how to interpret it, and it fe- seems oddly abstract for me. You know, how do you love God with all of your heart? I mean, it says love God, but then with all of your heart, what does that even mean? And, and how do you love God with all of your soul? I don't know what a soul is or what it means to have one. I don't really know what that looks like. And so that seemed abstract. And then to love God with all of my strength. I mean, I guess, I don't know, how would I define strength? I mean, what if I don't feel like I'm strong? And so I had all these questions about what that even meant. And, and why did Jesus say that was the greatest of commands? What did that even mean to make it the greatest of a command? And how does he get that from the text? And how does he get that from the Old Testament? And, and so it was really confusing to me. I didn't really have much there. And as I dove into it and studied it and, and started using it, I realized, oh, man, this is pretty substantial. There's a lot of meat here for me to grab onto. And so that's what I want to go over today. And hopefully by the end, I can impress with a little bit of my own passion for this and what it's meant for me about how this has helped form me in my faith and given me something that I can look at morning and evening to say, this is what it means for me to partner with God, to live with him and carry out this calling of mine. So I'm going to start off reading Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And so to put it into dumb Hebrew, as I would say, I don't know Hebrew, I just know some of the words. It says, Shema, O Israel, Yahweh is our Elohim, Yahweh is one. You shall ahava, Yahweh our Elohim, with all of your levav, all of your nefesh, and with all of your meod. And so I'm just using the key words there. And so today what I want to look at is those words I just put in there. Shema, Yahweh, ahava, levav, nefesh, and meod. I know it sounds abstract, but bear with me. Um, I'm pulling largely from the Bible Project and other commentators and uh, books that I've read. Um, I read a book called The Jesus Creed that is phenomenal on this uh, and talks about the idea of that he advocates that every Christian today should learn the Shema, uh, the Jesus Creed, with that love your neighbor as yourself, and we should say it morning and evening. And so that book was wildly inspiring. So what I want to do is go through those words. I'm going to give you a definition, the context in the Shema, and then it's a question that we can wrestle with today. So I'm going to go through. It's going to maybe feel like a fire hose, but... Um, the beauty of digital services, you can pause, or you can rewind, or you can just listen again. So I'm going to count on that for whatever I come up short here. So it starts off with the word Shema. What does the word Shema mean? The definition, we translate it, hear or listen, O Israel. And so the word means listen or hear, but that means more than that. The Hebrew word is much more, um, much more full. It means not just to listen, but to obey. To give you an example, it'd be like my kids, if I tell my kids to go and do something, to go and clean your room, and they would have listened to me, but they didn't go and clean their room, they didn't shema. Yes, they may have heard me, but they didn't do it. They did not shema. In fact, if you were going to teach a kid, how do I teach my kids to not just hear me, but to actually carry out what I'm saying them, what I'm saying to them? But how do I teach them to respond to what I'm saying? You would say, I need to teach them how to shema. It means more than just the sense of listening. It implies uh, a lifestyle. It implies an obedience behind it. And to give you some examples, in Genesis 3, 8, it says, They shema the sound of the Lord, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So they heard God. But instead of obeying, instead of coming out and being with him, they went and hid. And so the idea they hid, they didn't obey. They went and hid. Genesis 11, 7, the Tower of Babel. He says, Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not shema one another's speech. They may not hear, they may not understand, because they're going to hear each other's speech, but they not, they not understand, they can't carry out what each other is saying to each other. So they will not shema one another. To move on, Exodus 24, uh, he took the book of the covenant and read it in its hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken to, me, to us we will do, and we, and we will shema. 
that Israel is saying, not only will we listen, but we will shema. We will listen and obey. It is telling God that we will shema him. And the idea can, continuing in Psalm 27, 7, David, talking to God, kind of appeals to God and says, God, shema, oh my God, when I cry out loud. He's appealing to God and say, God, don't just hear me. Hear me and act. God, would you shema to me? But David is saying, listen, act when I speak, God. And this is how the declaration starts. Listen here, God's people. Listen, obey our God. It's a declaration of not just hear, but to do. And the question that I often have with us as modern day Christianity, specifically in America, is are we listening but not doing? Are we listening but not doing? That's the question I want to leave us with. And so moving on to the word Yahweh. Yahweh is used all over the Old Testament. It's used over 6,500 times in the Old Testament. In fact, when I try to pick up all the occurrences in my, on my phone, it actually stops the app and breaks it down because I can't load that many things onto my, on my phone. And this is a hard definition. What does Yahweh even mean? It's a hard one. And so I'm reading a book by a rabbi named Rabbi Foreman called The Exodus That Passed You Over. And he puts an illustration out there and he says, to, to try to understand who God is, to try to have a grasp of him, is kind of like if we were Monopoly characters. That if we were all the little shoe, the little hat, the little dog, you know, I was always a thimble, I like the thimble. Uh, and so if we were those pieces and we were kind of walking around the board and we were talking to each other and saying, who is this Parker? How do we understand Parker? And the idea behind this is that we have no context to understand who he is. Creation isn't, the, the creator isn't his creation. He's outside of his creation. That we don't have language, we don't have a box big enough, that we can't even come close to grasping who God would be. It's as if the pieces within the game are trying to describe who Parker was. They'll always come up short. And so when God meets Moses, uh, and, and he says, who shall I, Moses asked God, who shall I say you are? What do I tell them your name is? He says, my name is Yahweh. He says, my name is, I, I, which means I was, I am, and I will be. And God is saying, I am outside of your existence. I am greater and bigger than you can even grasp, and this is who I am. I am Yahweh. In Exodus 6, 3, it says, God says to, to Moses, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, meaning El Shaddai. But, my, but by my name, the Lord, meaning Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. That God comes to Moses and says, I've told your ancestors, I went by El Shaddai, which means God Almighty, a God of power and might, a God that can do what he says he's going to do. He says, I come to you. I did not give them my name Yahweh then, but I give it to you now. This is my name. I want you to know who I am. And it begs the question of why does God want to give them his name Yahweh right at the Exodus? I mean, wouldn't El Shaddai make more sense, a God of power and might? He says, I'm more than power and might. I want you to know who I am. I'm a relational God. I want to know you. And he gives them this name. And this name becomes so sacred that this is what later on that the Jews are going to have a hard time even, even saying. They're going to put uh, alliterations. They're going to actually change the name to Adonai. So that instead of reading Yahweh, they're going to read Adonai. Or maybe, sometimes they would even say Hashem, which is the name. That when scribes would write down the name Yahweh, they'd actually go and they would cleanse themselves before they would write the word. Imagine describing the Old Testament in 6,500 times you're going to go and cleanse yourself before you write that name. And this becomes kind of the, the emphasis here. I mean, even the Bible begins this way. That in Genesis 1, it introduces us to a story about a, an Elohim. A, uh, Elohim is more of a spiritual being, right? This kind of non-human, it's a, it's a spiritual being is the best way to put it. There's a spiritual being that created all of the earth. And it begs the question, well, who is he? Can we know him? We have all these questions over who this spiritual being is. In chapter 2 of Genesis, he introduces himself. He goes, oh, my name is Yahweh. You can call me Yahweh. Now, just to give a context so that it doesn't, so for those of you who have a little skeptical mind, the Torah was written during the Exodus and was given to people in their Exodus. This is all put together at the same time. So that's why God is using his name here. And he says, I didn't give you my name before. And so what does this mean in the Shema? It means that what they're saying is, it's a declaration that God is our God. Yahweh is our Elohim. He stands alone in our hearts. It's a declaration of them saying that when it comes to who we worship, it's Yahweh. That at Sinai, when God went and married his people, 
And when he, even after the affair, when he went up and renewed the vows, that he is saying, I am your God, you are my people. It's his covenantal language, which will be next week. But he is saying, this is who I am, this is who you are. And it's Israel responding with the Shema and saying, yes, we say I do to this marriage. We say I do to this relationship. And it says, hear, O Israel, hear all you people of God, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh alone. And that becomes a declaration for our, his people, for us today. And the question I have is, what other, what other gods compete in our life for our affection? How do you declare that God has that place alone? What does it look like for you to tell those other gods, you are not my God? I will not worship those things. God, you are my God. You are my God alone, no other. As if to say to my, my wife when I tell her, you are my wife. I love you among all the other women. That only in you do I find my affection. No other woman will compete with you for my affection. It's the same imagery that we have here. And so we move on and says, we should love our God. The word here is ahav or ahava, which means love in Hebrew. And I'm not going to go deep into it, but it's the same word used all over the Old Testament about a husband loving his wife or a mother or a father loving their child or, or a friend loving another friend or a brother loving a brother or a sister loving a sister or, uh, or a people having affection for their king. It's this idea of this we love somebody else as an intimate relationship. It's the same thing that's going to pick up in the New Testament when it says we love God because he first loved us. That this concept of we love God because he loved us. And it's a declaration back. It says, God, why do we love you? Why do we want to love you with all of these things? Because you first loved us. It's the saying I do as well. It's our end of kind of the marriage vow of saying, I will love you with all of these things. It's like a commitment, a vow of saying, this is my end of my relationship. That I will speak to us as a church. Hear, O church. We will listen. We will obey. You are our God. You alone. And these are our vows to you. We will love you with all of our heart. Now, the word here in Hebrew is lavav, or lev for short. And uh, lavav is going to be used over 250 times. Lev, almost 600. And we translate it, we translate it heart, but it's not quite, uh, well, it's more nuanced than that. And so to give you an idea, they don't, in Hebrew, there is no word for brain. So heart is like the only word they got for this. Um, and, and so it's kind of a, not only is it a, and actually part of the anatomy, but it's where they thought most of the emotions and these things kind of lied uh, as far as like your brain. I'll get to that in a second. And so a couple of verses to put it in the context. In 1 Samuel, it says, In the morning when the wine had gone out, uh, Nabal, his wife, told him these things, and his lev died within him, and he became a stone. This man had a heart attack. So it says his, his heart died within him. Limitations 3 says, This I recall to my lev, therefore I have hope. So it begs the question, how do you recall to your heart? What does it mean to recall to your heart? Because your heart is, in our mind, more of an emotional place. But he's saying, I will remember in my heart. Or in Solomon's, um, in 1 Kings, it says, And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. So how do you put wisdom in your heart? And there's all these other verses. You can look it up. Do a word study on any of these. Go to Blue Letter Bible. Go to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. In five, you'll see the Shema. You can go there, click on, click on the verse, you'll click on the Hebrew words, it'll give you all the occurrences, you can do a bun, nice, fun word study. Um, so what does, what does Lavav mean? And so I believe, I'm uh, stealing from Bible Project, that they kind of put it in the sense of that it is your thoughts, your emotions, your desires, and your choices. So your thoughts and your emotions, your desires and your choices. And so these are my definitions for these that I kind of add in for our students. Your emotions are how you react to the world. When it comes to your emotions, that it's just you responding to the world happening around you. It's, emotions are a response. Thoughts are us trying to understand the world. How do I try to perceive what's going on? How do I make sense of things? How do I solve these, these things that I want to comprehend and put into boxes? Those are our thoughts. Our desires are what we want to be. What do we want the world to look like? What do we want the world to, to kind of move into? And our choices or how we bring about what we want them to be. And so we make choices according to how we want to bring that about. Now the thing with this is all four of these, our emotions, our thoughts, our desires, our choices, they by themselves are statically neutral. right? And what I mean by that is there is no um, an emotion, a thought, a desire, or a choice are by themselves have no morality tied to them. They just kind of stand alone. 
what makes them either positive or negative, where they can kind of go awry, is what we do with them, where we turn with them. Where do we turn with our emotions? Where do we turn with our thoughts? Where do we turn with our desires? Where do we turn with our choices? Because where you turn will show you what you love. And so in the Shema, what they are saying is, we will turn to God with our emotions, with our thoughts, with our desires, and with our choices. Like any kind of intimate relationship is if we behold these things from them, then we're really not pursuing intimacy. That Israel is saying that we will turn to God with the very things that lie within us. That when it comes to our emotions and our internal thoughts, we want to bear all of those things to God. That we want to make choices and have desires that are in line with who he is and what he wants us to do. Because where you turn shows what you love. And so if we think of a, again, I'll use this kind of ongoing here, these next three. If an, if an unbiased observer came into your life, what would they observe of where you turn with your emotions, your thoughts, your desires, and choices? What are the sources that you turn to? What are the places that you go? And so that becomes a question. And that's the question I have for us today. Where do you turn with these? That when you react to the world, where do you go? When you try to understand the world, where do you go? That when you try to figure out what you want the world to be, where do you go? And when you make the choices to bring that about, where do you go? So the next one is nefesh. And this is the one we translate soul. And this is probably the, um, the hardest one of the mix because soul is just a bad translation. Uh, and not because the word is bad. It's because we have all this baggage from this Greek idea that our body and soul are different. And there's a bunch of Greek philosophy in this, and you can dive down that rabbit trail. And there's a, some fun commentaries and books that talk about this idea of how it's done more harm than good inside Christianity. But the idea of the word soul here, nephesh, it really means neck, throat, or living being. And that's going to be a big kind of box shift here, but bear with me. So in Genesis 121, God created the great, cre great sea creatures and every living nephesh that moves. And so every creature is a nephesh. Um, and so it says in Genesis 2-7, Then the Lord formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living nephesh, which implies that he used to be a dead nephesh. And so the idea of the man became a living nephesh. Numbers 19.11 says, Whoever touches the dead nephesh of any person shall be unclean for seven days. So if you touch a dead body, that you're unclean. Touch a dead animal, a dead nephesh, again, that you're unclean. And so again, it's this idea, uh, to Psalm 105, 18, talking about Joseph. says, His feet were hurt with fetters. His nephesh was put in an iron collar. And so when Joseph was sold into slavery, that they put a collar around his nephesh, his neck. And that's what drove him away. Or Song of Solomon, uh, 1 7 says, Tell me, you whom my nephesh loves. Tell me, what you whom my nephesh loves. It's this idea of, of my body, my living being, all this thing that makes me a living creature. That's what nephesh means. From our hunger to our, our, our thirst, this is what makes a nephesh. It's why uh, a murderer in the Bible is called a, a nephesh killer, or a kidnapper is called a nephesh stealer. That the idea is we are nephesh, that we are living beings, that we do have life, that we, this is what makes us um, alive. And so what does it look like in the Shema for us to say that I will love God with all of my nephesh? What makes you a living being? Your hunger, your cravings, your thirst, the fact that you breathe, right? Uh, your physical being. I mean, the best analogy I have for this is, is looking at little kids or or young love, right? Because it's, it's our, our bodies are just enwrapped in our like emotion of what it means to be us, right? It's like little kids when something really exciting happens. You can kind of see it within their whole body of their excitement. It goes everywhere within them. It's like their whole living being, their nephesh is excited and filled with joy or grief, right? When they get sad, all the little kids' demeanor just changes to whatever, emo whatever emotion, but whatever's going on, their whole body changes into that. Right? Or young love about the idea of this, this pure kind of, you know, young romantic comedy, whatever love it is. But this idea of, of my whole body and being is sought after you. That you are all that I desire. Everything in me is just longs and pangs for you. And there's some overlap, I know, with the heart here. But what does it mean for us as living beings just to go after God and say, you are what I desire. That I am incomplete without you that you are what I, I crave, you are what makes me full, that you are what makes me alive. 
This is what it means to love God with all of our nefesh. And so what makes, my question is, what makes us alive? What makes you, what does your living being crave to make you alive? And this is Israel saying that they will crave God. The last one, moving on, is to meod. And it's used about 300 times in the Old Testament. And this one we translate strength or might, depending on the translation. And this is a hard word to translate because uh, it does, we don't have a box for it, the way we translate it. It's because this word is an adverb, which means it is there to make other words more powerful. And so, um, to give an example, in Genesis 1, 31, uh, when God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was meod good, which means it was, we would translate, it was very good. That's the word meod. Uh, in Genesis 4, 5, when Cain, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was meod angry. He was very angry, super angry. Genesis 17, 6 is that God says uh, to Abraham, I will make you meod meod fruitful. I will make you into a nation, and kings shall come from you. The idea that Abraham would be very, very fruitful. When you double up words in Hebrews, it makes them even stronger. It's like extra, extra. And so he basically, God is end up saying, he goes, I am going to use a word that makes it super twice. This is what you will be. Uh, Numbers 14.7. It says the land that we're going to go into is meod, meod, good land. And so this is the idea. Uh, it's even Psalm 112.1 says, um, praise Yahweh. Blessed is the man who fears Yahweh, who meod delights in his commandments. Not just delights in his commandments, but super delights in his commandments. And so the idea of meod, I'm going to steal from the Bible project here, they use the word muchness. What does it mean to have muchness? And the word can mean anything. It's kind of like an all-encompassing word that I will love you with all of my heart, my thoughts, my emotions, my desire, my choices, all of my living being, what makes me a human, what makes me crave, what makes me alive, what makes me just a human and alive and living, and then everything else I got. Everything else. And depending on the translation or history, they translate that money, resources, possessions, time, right? I mean, whatever that looks like, what does it look like for us to love God with all of these things? And so in this context, you're saying, I will love God with whatever I have at my disposal. From the very strength within me, from, from the idea, I will open my home, my possessions, my resources. I will give my money, I will give my energy, my time, that I will give all that I got to this relationship. Right? And again, this sounds like marriage vows. It's the idea of, what would I withhold from my spouse? Right? Or a parenting of what would I withhold from my children? Or intimate friendship, what would I withhold from my friend that I will give you everything? Everything I got, I want to put it down for you. And it's Israel declaring who God is for them. And so again, going back to our unbiased observer, and going back to Nefesh as well, if they were to observe your life, look at your resources, your time, your money, your energy, all of these things, what would they say you give your maod to? your muchness too. If they were walking around, would they say, this is what this person loves? That when it comes to giving them everything, this is where they give those things. And this is what the Shema is. It picks up these things and they write it on their hearts. They teach their children of, this is who we are as a people. We are a people of God's family who love God. Yahweh is our God, not the others. He alone is our God, and we will love him with all of our love, with all of our nefesh, and all of our ma'od, and this is who we are. And Jesus, and his, Jesus Shema, is going to take that one further and says, not only is that the greatest commandment to love God that way, but the second greatest is the ahava, your neighbor, as yourself. He takes the same word and flips it over to Leviticus 19.18. It says, in the same way that you are to love God, you are to love your neighbor. And love your neighbor as yourself. And this is the idea that Jesus picks up. He says, what does it mean then for us as we live out our faith? What does it mean for me to live out my faith and go, why do I live by this? Why do I want, personally, I'm not saying this is a conviction you should have. Personally, why do I want to say this Jesus Shema every morning and every evening? Because for me, every day I wake up, I want to have a declaration of what I'm living for. That this is what I'm going to stand for. Yahweh is my God, him alone. I want to love him with all of these things. And I want to love my neighbor as myself. So what does that mean? Often what that means, I think what it means is, we don't expect people to look a certain way. That we don't get in uh, arguments over or what this looks like or what that looks like. Is that we are willing to love them above everything else. 
that we say, I don't care how you look, I just want to love you. I want to honor the way God designed you. I want to honor the gifts that God has given you. And I want to honor where you are in your journey. I'm not here to impart my convictions upon you. And I'm not here to judge you for not being something that I think you ought to be. That I want to love you. I mean, and the best way to kind of take this back is if we think of how does God view us? I mean, the best illustration is use the inverse. If you think of your own life, that when we've come up short, when we've failed, and we've had our you know, learning process of things that we look back over the years and go, I cannot believe I, 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 I said that. I can't believe I even believed that. I mean, I couldn't have been further off when it came to my worldview. I couldn't have been further off when it came to Scripture. Or I can't believe that I was that way when I was younger. I cared so much about these other things. and I was idolizing this thing instead of that. I mean, we have all of these things when we look back. And we say, what did it mean for God to love us? What did it mean for God to to come back in and say, I love you, it's okay, I'm still here, I'll forgive you, that I want you to be in my family and I want to be in an intimate relationship with you. Like after the affair at Mount Sinai, when God takes Moses back on the mountain and says, I still want to marry you, I still want to be your God, I still want you to be my people, I still want to have intimacy with you. How does God treat us in those moments that he shows us love in those moments? <clears throat> what does it mean for God to interact with us at those times. Right? And that becomes the inspiration because with that affection, with that just penetrating love, we look back and say, God, I want to love you the same way with everything, that I'm willing to give up everything, even my very life, that you give up your very son for me. Right? And it's that way that we look and say, this is how I want to love God. And God says, this is how I want you to love your neighbor. How did I treat you when you were in these times? How was I gentle but firm? Right? How did I come alongside you? How did I, I pick you up and say, come with me? I'm not here to throw stones. I could, but I'm not. Let's get up and go sin no more. What does that look like? Come and be with me. Let me love you, have affection for you. This is what Jesus is saying of what it means for us to have this as our second greatest commandment. He's taking the same thing and says, let God's love be the inspiration and the motivation for how you live your life. How did God treat you? Treat others the same way. Well, how does God love you? Love him back with all the affection that you have. This is what it means to set the world back right again. Now, this creates quite a problem the minute we try to live it out. And that problem is going to be difficult because what we find in the very Shema and what we find all throughout the Old Testament is that when it comes to living this out, we're humans and we make mistakes. Jeremiah talks about uh, the idea that... Um, we, sh we do not shema. We listen, but we don't shema, right? It's idea of like we have forgotten what it means to obey God's voice, that our hearts are wicked above all things, right? When it comes to it, we, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from evil that you may be saved. How long shall your wicked thoughts lo lodge within you? Right? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Right? When it comes to our nephesh, what does it mean for our nephesh to actually give ourselves to God and not be animals, like a past lesson we went over? He says this, he says in Jeremiah again, also on your skirts is found the lifeblood of the guiltless poor. You did not fight, find them, you did not find them breaking in, yet in spite of these things, you say, I am innocent. Surely his anger has turned from me. Behold, I will bring to you judgment for saying, I have not sinned. So we have mistreated the nephesh of others. I mean, this is what God is saying. In the Psalms and the prophets, they're saying is that we are broken, that our hearts, our life, our neck, our living being, our muchness is that we always seem to go astray. From the Tower of Babel to the Book of Judges to what caused them to go into exile, that when it came to giving God our everything, we found that between our sinful nature that always seems to creep up and lead us astray, to the fact that does God really love us? Can we really trust him with all of these things has just caused us to stumble apart. But when it comes to Jesus, he says you can trust that, you can, that God will love you. And so much so that he's willing to give his only son. That Jesus is willing to show us the way and then die for us that we might see it. That we can have the assurance that if we live this way, that we love God and we love people with all of our hearts, we might get trampled. We might get mistreated. We might get mocked. It might cause us to have all kinds of fears and insecurities, but in the end, God will lift us up. 
that death will not be the victor, that in the end God's kingdom will reign and he will bring about the end in which everything will be set right. That what does it look, for, look like for us that we can say, I can live this way because God will make a way for me to do it. And it's through Jesus and the Holy Spirit that we can have the power to do so. So what I want to end with is the Shema is a declaration, a vow, a return to God of saying, yes, I do. I want to be in this with you. I love you. And I love you because you first loved me. And with that, I want to go to communion. What does it look like to take communion in response to that vow as well? That when Jesus says, break bread with me, that he's using it as a Passover feast, that he is saying, what does it look like to remember who God is and how much he loves us? How do we respond to him and says, I will remember who you are, Lord, because you remembered me. And so with that, we'll turn to communion and grab the bread. The bread is a symbol of Jesus pouring out his life for us. It is the manna in the wilderness that gave us sustenance. It is the very thing that gives us strength to live the way God wants us to live and to trust him. And let it be, as we take this bread, that we might take it as individuals, and we'll take it by ourselves. And as we take this, it might be something that we can tell God and says, God, you are my God, you alone. And I will love you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and all of my muchness. And let it be a declaration that we say, God, today and every day, I am in on this relationship and on this vow. And with that, let us take the bread. And now, as we take the cup, a symbol of Jesus pouring out his blood for us, a symbol of the Passover lamb that was killed so that we could, be, we could live, a symbol of the firstborn being redeemed, that God would offer his son for our sake. This is a symbol of what Jesus poured out for us. And here today, we're going to take this together as a congregation, as a corporate body. I know we're separated in different places, but with the symbolism together, who you're with, take it together. And in hearts, let's all take it together. We might say as a church, 
Hear, O Grace Baptist, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone, that we might together be his people.
One of the strong messages of Scripture is that our God is sovereign over all, and He has promised never to leave us or forsake us. He is faithful and can be trusted. Deuteronomy 33 verse 27 puts it this way, The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Let's sing again together. Trust you, God, whatever.
it's my way, I put my trust in you. Amen. Amen. As a benediction, I will leave you one more time with the Shema. I'd encourage you to read books, listen to sermons. Uh, the Jesus Creed is an amazing one of what does it look like for us to have a creed that says, this is what it means to love God, to give God everything I have, to be committed to this relationship. So hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. We love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and all of our strength, and love our neighbor as ourself. Amen. joy to praise God together. Thank you to Eric and Barb for joining me this week, and thanks to all of you for being here with us today. Have a beautiful week in the Lord. God bless you all. See you next week. Amen.